Item six is uh, leaders' questions. Um, question number one, Councillor Hogg. Question one to the leader. I answer Councillor Hogg's question directly. I welcome you to your first council meeting. And may I particularly remind colleagues of uh, the distinction with which you conducted yourself at the Tooting Parliamentary by-election uh, in the very difficult circumstances of uh, the death of uh, Chair Cox earlier that day. I think you brought great dignity to the borough and for which I think your colleagues would uh, want to be appreciative. And the same evening, of course, brought uh, Councillor Dr. Aileen Khan to be the Member of Parliament tooting. And I note that our nuclear umbrella is safe in our hands, but I hope that um, her future isn't safe in the hands of the tooting momentum branch. But particularly, I'd like to sort of mention Councillor Reverend, uh, Mr. Reverend uh, uh, McKinney, who is fast becoming, I think, uh, like um, former Reverend Calcutt James, the kind of uh, parson emeritus to the council. Uh, welcome. Um, responding to Councillor Hogg's good question, well, I think uh, once is detailed, but one of the things that members need to be aware is that this is as a result of a housing crisis uh, in London, and there's no denying that there is one. But of course that is as a result of the growing population in London, and in fact it is very clearly a, a evidence that the reason why London's population is growing is because not very many people are leaving London as traditionally they used to. And part of the reason why people are not leaving London is that London schools have improved immeasurably compared to elsewhere in the country. So the earlier lure of good education in Kent or Surrey or Sussex is not the lure anymore that it was, and I think people are making homes that their, their lives longer lives in, in London, which is a good thing. But of course, in itself, it creates uh, the, the kind of problems uh, that uh, Councillor Hogg's question alludes to. Supplementary, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Hogg. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and I'd, I'd just like to echo Councillor Govindia's words um, about your time so far in office. Uh, and just to say, as a new uh, leader of this group, I uh, look forward to working with Councillor Govindia. I think uh, certainly not going to go easy on him, but uh, as we've seen from the sort of co-sponsored motions we've got tonight, where there are things where we can agree on the interests of residents, we can work together. Uh, and just briefly, Mr. Mayor, just to pay tribute to Councillor Osborne, who filled this bench before me, a, a sort of popular and effective leader of our group. Um, thank you. When I, when I um, back to the question, I suppose, when I joined the council in 2010, uh, around 450 families um, were then spending the night in Wandsworth temporary accommodation because they were homeless. But now, due to a combination of spiralling rents and flat wages and cut benefits, that figure is set to triple to 1,485 families. So this is hundreds of children left school today to go home to hostels or unsuitable bed and breakfast accommodation. Does the leader recall that this council resolved unanimously last year to reduce the number of families in Wandsworth temporary accommodation year on year? And can he explain why we've broken our word? Um, thank Councillor Hogg for his supplementary. And in fact, yes, I do look forward to working with him. Although I have to say that there are wiser and older heads in, on this side who say that this idea of uh, reaching out and doing joint motions will end in tears. I'm afraid uh, it might already be doing, heading that way. Um, returning to his supplementary, of course it is right that every time council sets its ambitions out, that it makes the most challenging ambition. And so to say that we would want to year on year reduce the number of families in BNB is a absolutely right. That is the right thing to do, rather than to say, oh, well, we can't match it, so therefore we will not challenge ourselves. Second thing is that what Councillor Hogg describes would, would be sort of something to be worried about if this was unique to Wandsworth. This is a London-wide phenomenon, and the truth is that we are managing this particular crisis better than many, many other London boroughs. That is not to say that this is not a crisis for the 1,300 or so family in bed and breakfast. Of course it is. But, see, I looked at the positive reasons why London's population has grown and why people want to stay in London despite the difficulties. And, of course, Councillor Hogg immediately looks at the reasons why we have made life difficult. 
what I can pledge again, if, uh, if he'd like to know, is that we will strive and continue to strive to reduce the numbers of families in bed and breakfast accommodation. And even if we fail, we'll still continue to strive. Question Second supplementary. Sorry. Um, could I ask the leader, uh, he says that um, this council sets itself stretching targets and this is one that it's failed to achieve because it was stretching. Um, I wonder how that marries with the comments of the finance director in the recent finance and corporate resources committee who said he doesn't like to set uh, targets too high so his staff fail because that's demoralising. Uh, and often what we see in the target setting rounds, which is in this cycle, uh, is that when the council achieves a target, it doesn't set a stretching target for the following year. Um, so it seems to me that possibly this wasn't a stretching target, but you still failed to meet it. I thank Councillor Daly for his supplementary. He'll never make a cost among her. He mixes his apples and pears, so he's always doing that. And in fact, that's what he's just done. Thank you. Question number two uh, to the leader, Councillor Hogg. Question two to the leader. Um, thank Councillor Hogg for his um, supplementary and this is a bit like a regular return question from the side opposite. My question, my answer is set out here and it is very clear that when you have a performance related pay regime, which is what we have, that you measure the performance in a balanced way and, and, and in a proportionate way. That is what we have done. Of course, Councillor Hogg may be familiar with other performance related pay regimes that are different from ours and perhaps if they are so different from ours, he let us know. And I sometimes wonder whether the regime of performance related pay that he might be more familiar with is the one at the moment uh, um, sort of benefiting, I guess, uh, the leader of opposition, uh, Mr. Corbyn, whose performance is rewarded but performance is lacking. Supplementary. Well, I mean, I guess talking about performance and reward, I mean, since the Ofsted report, the leader has authorised well, well, well over a million pounds of new expenditure for the Education and Children's Services Department almost £30,000 for a new cabinet member, further £8,000 for a new chairman for the OSC, and now handed more than £30,000 in bonuses to the chief executive and the deputy chief executive. I mean, he appears to be adept at throwing money at these problems, but he's rewarding those who are responsible rather than penalising them. And of course, it's people rather more junior who have actually left the council as a result of this. Can he explain what steps he's taking, he is taking and he has taken to stop similar failures in other departments that just happen not to have the Ofsted level of scrutiny. Thank Councillor for the supplementary. I think, um, firstly, he might want to check his facts. I uh, not have created a cabinet me member in response to the Ofsted report, and so he might want to also amend his uh, figure. But that's by the by. If this council had not actually responded, by addressing the financial need of the department identified, as a, identified through the officer report, he would have been the first to criticize. The fact is that we have actually responded with speed and with efficiency and effectiveness to address the, some of the gaps that the officer report identified and we have resourced it properly, adequately, and as fully as we need to. That's the mark of a responsive local authority. That is also a mark of a local authority that has actually managed its finances in such a way that it has resources for that very rainy day that in fact Ofsted visited upon us. As far as other departments are concerned, they are always constantly under review and constantly under scrutiny to make sure that departments perform well. And of course, in making sure that departments perform well, each and every member of this council has a role to play in it. I think uh, we have taken the right and appropriate steps to make sure that the Ofsted report is fully understood and the challenges it throws are met. Uh, second supplemental, Mr. Mayor. Who's this? On the right, sorry. Yeah. Um, does the leader share my lack of surprise that the opposition has once again chosen to grandstand on senior officer pay, apparently on the basis of a fundamental failure to understand that the levels of such pay uh, are assessed on the totality of officer performance? I thank Councillor Peterkin for his supplementary and, and, and share with him the incredulity that the Labour Party has failed regularly and continuously to understand the performance-related regime almost from the day it was implemented. And the question is, 
PRP is not unique to this council. It is now the, the preferred way of rewarding good performance in, in authorities and in public and private sectors, the third sector as well as, uh, uh, as, well as the third sector. And I think what it is right to do is that when you have a regime that me measures officer performance, that it does take account of the vast amount of success officers deliver as well as the places where performance is below expectation. Thank you. Question number three, Councillor Ryder. Question number three to the leader. I thank um, Councillor Ryder for his um, supplementary. I, and the, council's, the answer is set out here. I, I, I also want to take this opportunity to, to welcome uh, the Mayor of London's uh, conviction that Gatwick is the right option for London. This is an, uh, an argument that we have been putting forward for, for many, many years, and I'm glad that he's come to, come to this. But what the Mayor of London does need to do is that he does need to start shouting for additional and greater investment in Southern Rail network connecting uh, Gatwick to the, to the capital. He does need to look at the corridor between Gatwick and London, and in fact, further south of Gatwick uh, and the coast as a place where it could be a, a London's hinterland and therefore provide homes and, and jobs for Londoners as well as people from East and West Sussex. And he does need to start preparing uh, uh, robustly and eff effectively for whatever the announcement there may be from, from the centre so that he is not uh, sort of found wanting both of his knowledge and his ability to react. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jones, question number four to the leader. Question four to the leader. Well, I thank Councillor Jones for her question. And of course, this is about uh, 20 miles an hour. And there's a fundamental difference between the two sides in how we engage with our residents and how we persuade reluctant residents to see the, the, that, that what council is proposing might be in their interest. Our approach is to ask people the question. Our approach is to empower people to make the decision for their neighborhoods rather than impose something that we think is good for them. Because that is the fundamental, I guess, the difference between, between the two sides. Um, I, I think that the rest of the answer says that our approach has been successful, slightly more expensive, but not hugely so, and I guess you can never put a price on democracy. Councillor Jones, supplementary. Supplementary. Thank you for confirming it would have saved public money had you uh, gone ahead and implemented the borough-wide limit six years ago when we first suggested it. Do you now regret your letter to the Wandsworth Guardian earlier this year in which you lambasted Sadiq Khan for championing consultation on a borough-wide 20 mile an hour limit? I don't regret anything I write because I write with some thought and therefore I don't have a time to re re think again. What I would say very plainly about this is that I'm glad Councillor Jones now uh, understands that involving people is a good thing to do, unless she's saying that if it is expensive, don't involve people. So if she wants to be led by the cost of something, then perhaps um, she should say so. Uh, if she thinks that involving people in a decision that affects them, their streets and their friends and their neighbours and their, their, their journey to work and all that, then maybe she should come and, 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 and on, onto our, our side. Councillor Grimston, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Secretary Supplementary, Mr Mayor. Um, leader uh, recognised I'm absolutely delighted to hear that uh, Wandsworth is now a council which will listen to local residents and act on their behalf. Would you recognise that I've, I've put forward two quite big petitions to this uh, council from residents of Keeville Drive and Castlecombe Drive, uh, are representing the overwhelming support in both of those roads for turning them into one-way streets. That was simply dismissed by the uh, relevant committee and by the executive. Uh, in view of what I think is announced is actually a change of policy on the part of the majority group, would you now join me and the residents of that ward of ensuring that those roads go one way as the residents have requested? Or is this just a simple, uh, uh, nice little bat-off answer? that doesn't actually have any substance. I thank Councillor Grimston for his supplementary, and of course he knows very well that engaging with people has both its upside and downside. After all, he led this council's uh, decisions to, to review its uh, cultural uh, offer to the borough. 
But of course, returning to the roads, and I don't know the specific road dimensions, but I suspect the answer is pretty straightforward. Then engineers have said this ever since engineers were engineers, that if you are going to create a one-way street, that has to be a pair to go with it. But also at the same time, the speeds on the roads will in fact go up. That is their established wisdom, and that is the wisdom that engineers will give to members on any occasion when speeds, uh, when one-way streets are proposed. Not all one-way streets result in the type of uh, uh, speed reduction that Councillor Grimston would wish, and not all of them result in the type of accident prevention that he would wish. Uh, in my own former ward of Nightingale, Dalebury Avenue, Dalebury Road has a, has a one-way street, and it is a particularly dangerous road, especially when children want to cross from one side to the other. And in fact, members of Nightingale Ward will remember that there was a fatality not that long ago. So one-way streets are not the panacea, and so if the engineers give expert advice there and members accept expert advice, then that is not disregarding consultation outcomes. Councillor Lua, question five. Question number five to the leader. I thank Councillor Lua for, for his question. And um, this is the second question, Mr. Mayor, on, on, on the subject of aviation, particularly because we expect that the decision on, the expand, uh, on, on meeting London's aviation capacity will be made uh, perhaps after the August uh, uh, break. And I very much hope that the decision will be not to expand Heathrow for all the reasons that this council has uh, been uh, putting forward for year on year now. I am saying that one of the most important things I would uh, draw council's attention is that we have not set backward back in, in, in preparing for whatever the result uh, of that government announcement may be. If it is to expand Heathrow, we are well prepared to, and resourced to, uh, with our friends in other boroughs, to, to legally challenge the government's decision because we feel it to be unlawful, undeliverable, and we do not believe it to, it to be in the best interest of many hundreds of thousands of people who live in, particularly in West London, but actually many others whose, whose lives will be blighted by changed patterns of flights uh, taking off and landing. I think I want to once again reiterate that whilst we welcome the mayor's support, one of the, one of the things the mayor does need to do, that he needs to do what his predecessor did, was to sort of share with us financial and technical resources to make sure that the borough's case is robust and well argued and, and, and is eventually successful as it was last time. So Mr. Mr. Mayor. Uh, I thank the leader for his answer and on the basis of that, could I ask him on behalf of the council to press the mayor, perhaps in writing, to make a firm commitment against expansion at Heathrow and in support of Gatwick as the most sustainable option for aviation uh, capacity expansion in the southeast? I thank Castle Lewis for his supplement, and of course I, I'm happy to write that, but I mean I think that, uh, to be fair to the Mayor, he's already uh, said that. But I think what I would want to take the opportunity of that letter is to in fact press upon him the kind of technical and financial and other preparedness that I think he should be undertaking now, uh, <laughs> and, and be ready to strike should the, the decision, government's decision, be not uh, as, as he and I would wish. Question six. Thank you. Question six. Um, Question I... six to the leader, please. Thank you. Um, I think it was Councillor McKinney. Yes. I thank Councillor McKinney for, for asking the question on behalf of Councillor Carpenter. And uh, it's obviously natural that Councillor Carpenter, who, who understands money, also understands the financial pressures that this council is under. As I understand it, that this decision is, is a result of regular year-on-year -year underspend and, and where even when the money was rolled over to the, to the following year, the underspend continued to occur. So it is almost a question of, of, a, of a budget that is not uh, fully required or taken up. And it seems right that in those circumstances you to take the corrective. I also accept his point that uh, whatever grant we give uh, could be said to lever in extra money from elsewhere. But you know, my experience in working in the third sector has been that that is the claim that every grant maker or, or grant applicant would make. 
because every gram inevitably is part of a contribution to the totality of the cost of an organization or an organization's project. So every grant is kind of success, uh, and, and that success begets further success. So it's saying nothing new, but I think um, what Councillor Carpenter's <laughs> failed to show in his on the question is any particular evidence for his assertion, and simply saying, because I think it happens, we should not uh, take the money away. Supplementary. Councillor Kinney. Now, yeah. after the visits, yeah. we'll go straight into that. Yeah. Looking for a question, yeah. We need a question and we've got a speech. Mm. Okay. <coughs> Can we keep it brief? Thank Councillor McKinney for her supplementary. I think once again Councillor McKinney falls in the trap of making an assertion. She doesn't actually tell us how many organisations have applied and failed to, uh, to get the grant. I understand from the grant subcommittee chairman that in the sense, uh, each time they meet, there is inadequate number of good applications that they would want to support and fund uh, compared to where the money is available. And of course, the evidence that 50,000 is taken out of budget because of underspends in previous years is evidence that applications are not sort of uh, breaking down the doors wanting to be funded because they're just on there. But what's important also is to, 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 to see the end of the question. We talk about uh, uh, working with other foundations. Uh, the, the, the Ratsy Power Station Foundation and the Wimbledon Foundation to actually do that additionality, that our grant, their grant, and whether those two are working together could make the significant difference. Thank you. That concludes the 20 minutes. Second, second, second supplementary. Oh, Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, um, I think that Councillor Govindia has slightly missed the point here. Obviously, had he been in Finance Committee, he might have heard it. What, counts, what we were also pointing out is this is effectively a top slice of the budget. Clearly, it may be beneficial to have someone to help deal with the management of the fund, but actually, we are asserting this budget does not need to be so top sliced and therefore immediately move £50,000 from this budget, but actually it should be handled later and possibly through a different fund. Could the leader address that, please? Um, I must say to Councillor Crachard, thank you for your supplementary, but um, I can't be in every committee, uh, and that's why I didn't hear what, you, what, uh, what was debated in that committee. What I'd say is that... Uh, it's top sliced because there is, a, there is a top that can be sliced because it's not being used. If it was actually being used, there would not have been a top slice. But we are perfectly happy to sort of uh, discuss it further with my colleague, uh, the chairman of the Grand Subcommittee. But I have no uh, um, understanding from the conversations with her that, um, that there is a, a particularly huge demand uh, for this money. But if it were otherwise, I'm perfectly happy to have that conversation with her. Thank you. That concludes uh, questions to the leader.